everyone. This is Mitzi Langley from the Department of Human Services here with Mariska Jordan from the National School Lunch Program. Our webinar topic today will be Building a Healthy Plate with Fruits and Vegetables. We're so excited that we have you here today with us. Let's go over our training objectives and overview. Today we will learn to summarize at least two advantages for age groups in the updated infant meal patterns. Identify the fruit and vegetable subgroups in the CACFP, that's Child and Adult Care Food Program, and the National School Lunch Program, NSLP. Ways to make meals and snacks healthier and more colorful. Understand ways to serve a variety of vegetables, low in sodium. Ways to encourage children to eat more fruits and vegetables. And increase knowledge of farm to school and farm to early child care education. All right, so we're going to take a look and we're going to look at the key recommendations. So these key recommendations here are the guidelines for individuals. There, there are five guidelines. A healthy eating pattern includes a variety of vegetables, including dark green, red, and orange, black beans, or beans and peas, starchy vegetables, also other, other fruits, mainly whole fruit, grains, half whole grains, fat-free and low-fat dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, and or soy beverages. Variety of protein foods, including seafood, lean meats and poultry, eggs, beans and peas, nuts, seeds, and soy products. So, I'm sorry, soy products, oil. All righty, so next we're going to take a look at that new CACFP infant meal patterns. Centers and daycare homes offering meals through CACFP play a critical role in supporting the wellness, health, and development of children, older adults, and also chronically impaired disabled persons through the provision of nutritious foods. Child care providers in particular have a powerful opportunity to instill healthy habits in young children that serve as a foundation for healthy choices. Now we're going to talk about those advantages for the age groups. We want to encourage exclusive breastfeeding during the first six months of their life. That really does get their needs of their energy and nutritional needs. Most infants only need breast milk or iron fortified formula. Introducing solid foods too early will increase the risk of obesity. Next we'll, we'll turn, up, turn around and look at the new meal pattern for infants. They provide more nutritious meals and snacks. One important key note is to remember that vegetable or fruits must be served at snack time. That is completely new. So we will discuss these changes more in detail. Also, looking at the slide, we have something new on the juice, cheese food, and cheese bread are no longer credible for the infant meal pattern. Yogurt and whole eggs are now allowable uh, meat alternatives and ready-to-eat cereals may be served as snack. And as a reminder, the infant meal pattern is under one year of age. The new, the new meal pattern looking at our fruits and vegetables. The updated CACFP infant meal pattern requires that centers and daycare homes serve vegetables and, and fruit cooked mash parade as needed to obtain the appropriate texture for, and consistency at breakfast, lunch, supper, and snack for infants aged 6 through 11 years old or if the infant is development developmentally ready to accept them. Recent studies have found that dietary habits are fairly well established by two years of age and that a large population of infants do not consume any vegetables and fruit in a given day. The American, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends serving infants a variety of foods, including a, an increased amount of vegetable and fruits. Now let's take a look at this meal pattern on the screen. You'll notice we have the new meal pattern versus the old meal pattern. We have the breakfast infant meal pattern as our first example. You will see the old meal pattern has three age groups and now we have two age groups. I also want you to notice that the food components begin with a zero. This recognizes that all infants are not ready to except food at six months. This allows a gradual introduction of solid foods. This can be done a few different ways. It can be done one at a time or over the course of days. You should be documenting and serving the infant food, meals, and snack consistent with eating habits so your meals will not be disallowed. Your meals will be disallowed if you fail you should document on your production records. Let's continue to compare. This is the lunch or supper meal patterns for infants. Let's discuss the differences. You notice, of course, the new age groups. Only breast milk or formula for ages 0 to 5 months. 
and additional options such as whole egg. This is a new snack meal pattern for infants. Let's compare. Adding vegetables and fruit to the updated snack meal pattern for older infants ages 6 to 11 months, which included to help young children establish healthy eating habits as early as possible. Notice that you have three items listed as snack times, milk, bread, grain, and vegetable fruit. All right, let's look at this juice. The infant CACFP meal pattern prohibits CACFP daycare homes and adults for provi from providing juice to infants as part of the reimbursable meal. This is consistent with the recommendation of the National Academy of Medicine and American Heart Association of no juice before the age of one. Under the updated CACFP meal patterns, fruit juice and vegetable juice may be used to meet only the vegetable requirement at one meal or snack per day. This limitation is based on the dietary guidelines recommendation that at least half of the fruits consumed per day sh should come from whole fruits, fresh, canned, frozen, or dried. Now, while 100% um, fruit juice is part of the he a healthy diet, remember it does lack dietary fiber found in whole fruits and vegetables. And when consuming excess, it, it can really contribute to extra calories. At the age of one, juice is limited to three times a week for your programs. If a center or daycare home serves fruit or vegetable juice more than one meal, including snacks, the lowest reimbursement rate in containing the juice would be disallowed. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the new CACSP meal pattern. Okay. This is the new meal pattern for children and adults. It was recently revi revised to ensure children and adults have access to healthy, balanced meals throughout the day. Under the updated CACSP meal patterns, meals served would include a greater variety of vegetables and fruits, more whole grains, and less added sugar and saturated fat. These changes made to the meal patterns are based on the dietary guidelines for America and recommendations from the National Academy of Medicine and stakeholder input. So. Going over this as a suggestion to you guys, um, as an overview, you'll have a greater variety of fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, more protein. You'll have the appropriate meal levels, less added sugar, unflavored milk until the age of, age of six, and frying is no longer allowed at all for any of our CACSP programs. Vegetables and fruit prepared without added fats, added sugars, refined starches, and sodium are nutrient-dense foods according to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans are under-consumed by Americans. In the CACFP meal patterns, there is now a separate vegetable and separate fruit component at lunch, supper, and snack. This change means that children and adults are offered a serving of vegetables and a serving of fruit at lunch and supper. Let's take a look at the breakfast meal pattern starting at age one. You, know, you will notice that the only change is, is that three times a week, you can replace meat for a grain serving if you would like. And remember, this is optional for breakfast. So you do not have to do this um, substitution. It's only an option for you. All right, so next we'll move on to lunch and supper. Notice the separate vegetable and fruit component. Previously, vegetable and fruit was combined into one. Now you will see they are split. To increase flexibility in menu planning, center and daycare homes may choose to serve two vegetables at lunch and supper rather than serving a vegetable and a fruit. This means the fruit component at lunch and supper may be substituted by an additional vegetable. The substituted vegetables must be at least the same serving as the fruit component it replaced. To be consistent with the dietary guidelines, recommendations that all Americans should eat a variety of vegetables, when two vegetables are served at lunch or supper, they, may, they must be two different kinds of vegetables. Students in day, daycare homes cannot serve two fruits at lunch or supper under the new meal pattern. Now let's take a look at the snack meal pattern. Pay close attention to the updated serving size. Let's look at ages three and five together. You are required to serve a half a cup of vegetable and a half a cup of fruit. This is old. This is totally new um, from looking at the old meal pattern. Previously, you could have served any amount as long as it, it equal to a half a cup. Now you must serve the minimum serving size for reimbursement. Remember, these are the minimums, so you can serve more than this amount. 
Just remember, you may choose to serve two vegetables at lunch and supper rather than a serving of vegetables and a serving of fruit. This means that the fruit component at lunch and supper may be substituted by an additional vegetable. The substituted vegetable must be at least the same serving size as the fruit component it replaced. Separate vegetable and fruit components will increase the variety of vegetables and fruits served and consumed by children and adults. All righty, so next we're going to talk about some great tips to help you build a healthy plate with fruits and vegetables. Did you know by offering fruits and vegetables is a quick and easy way to make meals and snacks healthier and more colorful? Most toddlers consume enough fruit. However, most children four years and older do not. You can help them by offering fruits on your menu. Offering a variety of fruits and vegetables during the week can teach healthy eating habits that the children will use for life. It will provide dietary fiber to help children feel full and help their potty time make it easier. Add color, color, texture, and flavor to the children's play. Give children the vitamins and minerals they need to grow and play. It will also help promote proper digestion, help children feel full, and maintain healthy weight by providing dietary fiber. Alrighty, so now we're at the section we're going to look at a sample menu. Take a look up at, the, at the screen and you'll see the tables above for examples of reimbursement. Reimbursable lunch, supper meals featuring the fruit and vegetable are two vegetables in lieu of fruit. Starting with the ages of three to five, you will see you have green beans and peaches, cauliflower and broccoli, I'm sorry, cauliflower and carrots, broccoli and, and apples, sweet potato and zucchinis. Please note that vegetables do not need to be from different vegetable subgroups, such as dark green or red and orange vegetables, starchy vegetables, beans and peas, or other vegetables. So if you look at this uh, menu here, you can really see that we added a lot of variety for color, and it's also very nutritionally sound, and it's a very good example that you can use at your um, programs at your center. Let's take a look at this next picture. You'll notice two very colorful, great pictures. These are going to be some examples that I'll go over that talks about how you can encourage your children at your center to eat more fruits and vegetables. You can have a fruit and vegetable test tasting day. Encourage each child, child's family to bring one unique fruit for the group to taste. How about kiwi, maybe purple cauliflower, blackberries, or spaghetti squash? Another thing you can do is have them cook together. Children learn about fruits and vegetables when they help prepare the foods. Kids may try foods they avoid in the past if they help prepare them. What young children can help raise fruits and make faces, such as that picture there. They can pick kitchen tasks to help them master abilities, such as one child could mash bananas, some peel fruits, or they can even mix ingredients for a fruit salad. You also try to make your food fun. Serve fresh uh, vegetable sticks such as zucchini, yellow squash, celery, red pepper with snow princess dip. That's one of our USDA recipes. That is the low-fat ranch dressing. You can do hummus. That's uh, chickpeas, olive oil, and lemon juice. Or you can even make alligator eyelash dip. That recipe is plain lo low-fat yogurt mixed with dill and other herbs. Keep cut-up vegetables on hand for a quick appetizer to serve to occupy the children while they're getting ready. And again, your recipes do need to be USDA approved, and we have the links for those. You can also um, look at that big picture to the right. You can explore our Grow It, Try It, Like It educational kit that's provided for free from the USDA. Growing fruits and vegetables like strawberries in the garden or in a container can help increase the child's willingness to taste them. Finally, remember, the kids are watching you. You can eat fruits and vegetables with them, and they will love to eat them. All right, so now we're going to talk about sodium in children. Children need no more than 1,500 to 23 milligrams of sodium a day, depending on how old they are. American children and adolescents are eating foods high in sodium that far exceed the daily recommendation limit. Eating foods higher in sodium is associated with high blood pressure. Eating lower sodium foods can lower blood pressure somewhat in children. Lower blood pressure during childhood can lower the risk of high blood pressure as an adult. Taste preferences for high sodium foods is developed when children are offered high sodium foods. When children eat low sodium foods, they will prefer it. So this next um, picture here, we're going to look at how you can actually help cut the sodium um, for your foods that you may serve. So you can drain and rinse canned 
foods, it reduces the salt content. A recent study shows that draining and rinsing canned beans results in a 41 reduction in sodium. Draining alone results in a 36 reduction in sodium. Additionally, most frozen, fruit, most frozen vegetables are low in sodium, but not all. So you really need to be watching out for those that have an added sauces or seasoning. So if you look at the picture here, you see where there's a, a nice infographic. It says open the can, pour all contents into the colander and drain. Rinse under the faucet and drain. So remember, these are great tips. You may not have access to fresh or even frozen vegetables or fruits, but remember you, you, the canned vegetables or fruits are just as good. Be sure to give them a quick rinse. Next, I'll tell you about some things that you can use to help you credit your foods when you're doing your production records and your menus. So I want to really talk about, we talked about fruits and vegetables a lot, and I know a lot of you guys are interested in being able to serve salads on your menu. So how do raw leafy greens contribute to the vegetable component? Similarly, how does dried fruit contribute to the vegetable component? It's a little tricky, but I'll explain it to you. One cup of raw, uncooked leafy greens, that is like your lettuce and your spinach, we're not talking about iceberg, counts as half a cup of vegetables and a fourth a cup of dried fruit counts as half a cup of fruit under the CACFP meal pattern, which went into effect this year. This is consistent with the national school lunch programs as well. Next, we're going to look at how to credit your beans and peas. Because of their high nutrient content cooked, dried beans and peas may be considered both as a vegetable and a meat alternative. However, they cannot be credited as both a vegetable and meat in the same meal. Examples could be black beans, black eyed peas, chickpeas, kidney beans, lentils, navy beans, soybeans, split peas, and white beans. The USDA CACFP best practices recommends at least one serving, weekly serving, of each of the five subgroups. That includes your beans and peas. Some beans and peas, such as llama beans, green peas, snack, snap peas, and green string beans, fresh, they are, they are vegetables. They are not dried beans and peas, so they will not be served as a meat alternative. A serving of beans must contain the minimum required amount of beans, including other ingredients uh, such as sauce and pork fat. For example, a half a cup of serving of baked beans that contains an eighth a cup of sauce and pork credits for three-eighths of the vegetable. When counting beans and peas uh, towards the meal pattern requirements, the menu planner must round down all amounts to the nearest eighth a cup. For example, a recipe with two and a half tablespoons, that's 0.3125 cup of kidney beans per serving credits as a fourth of a cup of vegetables. Table one shows the serving size volume that equals two ounces. You can take a look at this chart here and it'll really help you when you're doing your food buying guide and then your purchases and your production records. So remember to use this and also remember when counting meat and meat alternatives towards the meal pattern that the menu planner must round down to the nearest uh, fourth ounce. For example, a recipe with two and a half tablespoons of kidney beans, which is 0.625 ounces of meat, per serving credits as a half an ounce of a meat alternative. Next, we'll talk about what types of fruits should you offer at your daycare center. That's a common question that you may have and your the parents may ask that as well. Fresh, frozen, canned, and dried fruit are all great choices. Introduce kids to the whole rainbow of fruit choices. Each fruit has its own unique flavor and nutrients. Providing different choices each day helps children get the nutrition they need. These are CACHP best practices. It includes to limit fruit juice. While 100% fruit juice, like we said earlier, is part of the healthy diet, it does not contain that dietary fiber from other forms of fruit. Serve a variety of fruits and choose whole fruits, such as those fresh, canned, dried, or frozen, more often than juice. Provide at least one serving of dark green vegetables, red and orange vegetables, beans and peas, starchy vegetables, and other vegetables once a week. Include good sources of potassium, such as bananas, dried plums, cantaloupe, honeydew melon, nectarines, raspberries, and orange juice. Potassium can help maintain healthy blood pressure in children. Continuing on about what vegetables should I offer, fresh, frozen, and canned are all great choices as mentioned before. Those vegetables contain different amounts of nutrients and fiber, so vary your vegetables you serve. Providing different choices also helps the children get the nutrients they need. 
Bright and Children plates with dark green, red, other vegetables, and always in incorporate different types of dried beans and peas. You can offer things like a white bean dip, or you can do mashed black bean burritos. So next we're going to transition to Mariska. She's going to give you some healthy tips on your national school lunch program. Thank you, Mitzi. There are a few key differences in NSLP in comparison to CACSP. First, we'll take a look at the NSLP meal pattern. This meal pattern was implemented a few years ago and is becoming second nature to those who administer NSLP. As you can see, the meal pattern is broken down by age group. I want to focus solely on the fruits and veggie requirements. If you look at breakfast, you will notice that all age groups are required to serve a daily minimum of one cup and a weekly minimum of five cups. There's no vegetable requirement for breakfast under NSLP. If you look at lunch, you will notice that K through 5 and 6 through 8 have a daily minimum of half cup and a weekly minimum of two and a half cups of fruit. Grades 9 through 12 have a daily requirement of one cup and a weekly requirement of five cups. As for vegetables, K through 5 and 6 through 8 have a daily requirement of three fourths cups and a weekly requirement of three and three fourths cups. Like the fruit, grades 9 through 12 have a daily requirement of one cup and a weekly requirement of five cups. As a reminder, food items included in each food group and subgroup and amount equivalent. So kind of be careful to watch out for those. As Mitzi, as Mitzi mentioned earlier, one cup of leafy greens will only count as half a cup. So be sure that you're weighing that um, so that it is credible. All righty, we're going to take a look at our vegetable subgroups. And following a healthy eating pattern includes eating a variety of vegetables from all vegetable subgroups. This table lists examples of vegetables in each vegetable subgroup. This chart identifies some commonly eaten vegetables in each subgroup. So for your dark greens, you have your arugula, your beet greens, uh, broccoli, cilantro, kale, romaine lettuce. And I will note that it's been cleared. I saw it on the news. So you can start saving romaine lettuce again. So kudos to... CDC for figuring that out. Then we also have the red orange. So you have your acorn squash, your butternut squash, carrots, sweet potatoes, tomatoes. And then you have your beans and peas. And those can be black beans or black eyed peas. Um, I do want to note that um, be careful with some of your canned beans because they won't be credible. Um, black eyed peas must be in their mature dry state. Um, there's also edamame and just different options for you. Um, Please note that vegetables do not need to be from different vegetable subgroups. Um, and examples of vegetables in each subgroup, you can make that decision on what you want to do. And vegetable subgroups are not required for CACFP. However, for NSLP, you will want to follow that. This continues some commonly eaten vegetables in each subgroup. So you have your starchy um, veggies and you can see like your corn, your green peas, potatoes, things of that nature. And then you also have your other. So you have artichoke, asparagus, celery, um, onions, snap peas, snow peas. And this is a good reference if you're ever running out of options or you feel like you're serving the same thing, you can always refer to this. And if this is something that you need, Missy and I will be more than happy to email that to you. All right, now we're going to talk about our Fresh Fruits and Vegetables program. USDA offers assistance to schools in an effort to encourage fresh fruits and veggies. Elementary schools in all 50 states, um, D.C., and territories of Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands are eligible to participate. Schools must operate the National School Lunch Program in order to operate the Fresh Fruits and Vegetable Program. Importantly, the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program prioritizes schools with the highest percentage of children certified as eligible for free and reduced price meals. This is because children from low-income families generally have fewer opportunities consume, to consume fresh produce on a regular basis. Eligible elementary schools must submit an application, and for those requirements, you can reach out to Mitzi and I, as well as the USDA website, backslash fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, selected elementary schools will receive $50 to $75 per student for each school year, and the exact amount per student funding is determined by the state agency, and it's based on the total funds allocated to the state and the student enrollment at participating schools. And with these funds, schools purchase fresh fruits and vegetables to serve free of charge to children during the school day. 
and participating schools submit monthly claims for reimbursement as you do normally. And we'll review those before payment is processed by us. Next, we're going to talk about one of my favorite, and that is Farm to School. So, are you participating in Farm to School? What is Farm to School, you ask? Well, let me tell you. Farm to School enriches the connection communities have with fresh, healthy food and local food producers by changing food purchasing and education practices at schools and early child care facilities. Students gain access to healthy local foods as well as education opportunities like school gardens, cooking lessons, and farm field trips. Farm to School empowers children and their families to make informed food choices while strengthening the local economy and contributing to vibrant communities. Farm to School implementation differs by location but always includes one or more of the following. Procurement, education, and school gardens. So why Farm to School? Well, because it's a win-win situation. Kids win, farmers win, and communities win. Farm to School provides all kids access to nutritious, high-quality local food so that they are ready to learn and grow. Farm to School activities enhance classroom education through hands-on learning related to food, health, agriculture, and nutrition. Farm to School can serve as a significant financial opportunity for farmers, fishers, ranchers, food processors, and food manufacturers by opening the doors to an institutional market worth billions of dollars. Also, who doesn't love a stimulant for the economy? Farm to School benefits everyone from students, teachers, and administrators to parents and farmers, providing opportunities to build family and community engagement. Buying from local producers and processors creates new jobs and strengthens the local economy. Can't stress that enough. We love to strengthen the economy. So procurement in Farm to School, we want to integrate local foods into a trial nutrition program. So defining local doesn't have to be hard. It is up to you to define what local means for your program, and there are many options. Local for one program operator may mean within the county, while local for another may include the entire state and even adjacent states. Definition of local can also vary depending on the season, type of product, and may also change by program or event. In order to get started, you want to start with planning. Planning how to integrate local items into meals, start by reviewing your menus to see what local foods you are already serving. Talking with suppliers and checking packaging and invoices for city or state of origin may reveal that local foods are already being served. The next step is to, to determine how to feature additional local products. Here are several ideas for incorporating local items. You can do a Harvest of the Month program where you pick one seasonal item to highlight each month your program is in operation. Feature special menu items, taste tests, or educational activities to showcase local products. And it's really important to get the children involved so that you can really get an honest opinion on what's going on and they'll be more willing to um, incorporate the, those changes. Education and farm to school. So students participate in educational activities related to agriculture, food, health, or nutrition, and there's also experimental education. Then students are also more confident about the foods they eat when they have been introduced to them via education. And NSLP providers are required to include an educational opponent component with after-school snacks. So if you're serving an after-school snack, you're already participating in some form of nutrition education, so you might as well do a, um, as I like to say, kill two birds with one stone by participating in farmer school. So learners are engaged intellectually, emotionally, socially, soulfully, and or physically. This involvement produces a perception that the learning task is authentic. The results of the learning are personal and form the basis for future experience and learning. Um, Education teaches young people how to be a combination of effective learners, effective collaborators, and effective communicators and creators, while also teaching and reinforcing creativity, open-mindedness, flexibility, efficiency, and reflection. Farmer school lesson plan examples. So you can also um, incorporate farmer school within regular lessons, like as you can see, we have a uh, lesson plan for math. It's through a carrot project. So math lessons can be used in the garden. You can measure plant distance and depth. You can also measure weights and values of vegetable production. So an example would be a pots of carrots project. Then with that same topic being carrots that you could potentially have grown in the garden, you can incorporate health and nutrition. So you can taste the different varieties and colors of carrots. Research nutritional value of carrots. Um, and you can also kind of look at um, explaining why this is important and the health benefits of the fresh products. And lastly, you have school gardens and farm to school. So 
So this is my personal favorite, and school gardens predate the National School Lunch Program. The federal government has been encouraging school gardening since the early 1900s, even building a school garden army during World War I and supporting victory gardens at schools during war, World War II. Today, the USDA Farmer School Census indicates that there are over 7,000 school gardens across the nation. USDA encourages school gardens by providing grant funding, guidance and resources, and support for food service personnel who are interested in purchasing products from a school garden. School gardens come in all shapes and sizes and districts with varying levels of land, um, finding ways to establish gardens in both inside and outside school grounds. Gardens can be as simple as a few containers on a windowsill or cover acres, and gardens thrive in all climates. Program operators found that even small gardens help children gain familiarity and comfort with the fruits and vegetables they are seeing more of at mealtime. I will say that it does take more than one person to keep gardens growing strong, so be sure that you have people who are passionate and who have a willingness to want to participate so that the school garden will thrive. Farm to Early Childhood Education. Farm to Early Care Education, as we like to refer to Farm to ECE, offers increased access to the same three core elements of local food sourcing, school gardens, and food and agriculture education to enhance the quality of the educational experience in all types of ECE settings. So that can include preschools, child care centers, family child care homes, Head Start, early Head Start programs in K-12 through school districts. From the ECE offers benefits that parallel the goals and priorities <laughs> of the early care and education community, including emphasis on exper um, experiential learning opportunities, parent and community engagement, and lifelong health and wellness for children, families, and caregivers. Looked like there was some excitement in the background, but no need to worry. We're fine. Farm to Preschool. Farm to Preschool is a natural expansion of the National Farm to School model and encompasses a wide range of programs and activities. Farm to preschool serves the full spectrum of child care delivery. Again, you, you are still dealing with the same population, preschools, Head Start, center-based programs in K-12 school districts, nurseries, and family home care facilities. Its goals are multi-level and include influencing the eating habits of young children while their preferences are forming, creating healthy lifestyles through good nutrition and opportunities such as gardening, improving healthy food access at home and within the community. The program components can include the following, and that is, sourcing local foods in school snacks and meals, promoting and increasing access to local foods for providers and families, and offering nutrition or garden-based curricula. In Arkansas, we were actually featured um, through the National Farm School Network, um, Feed Fayetteville, who, mains, who maintains a two preschool garden and provides bi-weekly garden activities, including planting, watering, composting, harvesting, cooking, and tasting. The produce is served in the preschool meals, and parents are connected by sending recipes and produce from the garden home. Ah, looks like we've made it to our web page resources. So as you can see, these are our CF CFP meal standards web page. You can definitely use this as a resource, and please check out the website for any additional um, information. And this will take you to the CACFP, but you know that you're always welcome to visit USDA as a whole and just maneuver through the entire website where you would encompass all of our programs. So that's CACFP, SFSP, as well as National School Launch. This is a USDA tool to promote fruit and vegetable intake. This is a resource provided by the USDA, and this tool is for school food service professionals packed with tips on planning, purchasing, protecting, preparing, presenting, and promoting fruits and vegetables. All righty. Well, this concludes our webinar for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to email Mitzi at M-I-T-Z-I dot Langley, L-A-N-G-L-E-Y, at D-H-S dot Arkansas, all one word spelled out, dot G-O-V, and Mariska Jordan at M-A-R-I-S-K-A dot J-O-R-D-A-N at D-H-S dot Arkansas dot gov. We'd love to hear from you. We want Goodbye. To, we want to thank you for participating in our webinar today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. The next few slides have our reference page, so you can be, be sure to check those out as well. We have some great memos you'd want to look at. So we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Goodbye.